Welcome to the smartest doctor in the room. Today's podcast, like many of my previous podcasts, is to bring you a super smart doctor who can shed some light on conditions overlooked by so many physicians. Today's guest, Dr. Neil Nathan, is one of those physicians. He has been practicing in Northern California, I believe, for four decades and has made his mark by diagnosing and treating complex medical cases such as toxic mold, chronic fatigue syndrome, and more recently, like many of us, mast cell activation syndrome, just to name a few. He is the author of several excellent books. Um, one I just finished reading, which I really enjoyed, Toxic, uh, Heal Your Body. I, I thought it was terrific. Uh, he's also the author of Hope and Healing, and Healing is Possible. You know, after reading the book Toxic, I almost wished that Dr. Nathan's practice was like down the hall from mine so I could share a cup of coffee with him or lunch and discuss the interesting cases that I see in my practice every week and get his pearls of wisdom. You know, for now, I'm lucky I have my wife who's pretty smart too. Uh, we're both in the same practice. So we discuss these really tough, complicated cases and how to you know, best help our patients. But for now, I'm fortunate to have him for the next possibly hour. We'll see how it goes and all of you to enlighten us on his medical expertise. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Neil Nathan to the podcast. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Does that mean I have to be really smart today? You, you have to be. No, <laughs> okay. I, um, no, but you, you know, you bring a lot, I think, to this discussion. You know, I've interviewed uh, over the last two years, I think we're almost at 50 podcasts, you know, some really academic, amazing people. I mean, one or two of them, I think, might win the Nobel Prize. Uh, but what I really enjoy about, hopefully, with today is that you are like me. I like to say we're down in the trenches. We're taking care of hundreds of these patients that have sometimes been to academic centers and not gotten answers. And, you know, I, I like to make the analogy. I just said, I'll tell this quickly because this is a story I tell my patients frequently. I almost feel like a lot of these type of patients have fell in a ditch. And I always tell them two things have to happen to get them out of the ditch because nobody cares how you ended up in the ditch. You just want to get out. And I make the analogy that I got to throw a rope and two things have to happen. One, they have to hold on, meaning they have to do their part, whether it's dietary or lifestyle changes. And I also have to pull and hold on because, again, using my therapeutics, hopefully pull them out. And then, you know, over time, figuring out, you know, how did they get into so much trouble? So the first question I want to ask you, Dr. Nathan, um, I'm sure you, like myself, so many times before a patient gets to my office, they've seen numerous doctors. What would you tell a patient that is suffering with a complex medical condition? How do they find a good, I guess, potentially combination, holistic, integrative doctor with conventional training? You know, what would you advise a friend or family member if they weren't in California? That's a very difficult question, to be very honest. Yeah, it's hard um, to start with a hard one. <laughs> well, it, I don't mind difficult questions. It's just it's very general. difficult. Okay. Yeah. It re it really depends on what they're suffering from, and um, since you said that there are two people that have to hold on to this rope, um, it depends on their attitude towards mm -hmm. healing. Good point. So, um, I get requests from literally all over the world for people who are suffering with complicated medical issues. And um, I try to distinguish in my communication with them a little bit about their motivation to get well. Because even though someone says they want to get well, as you know, that is covered sometimes with a whole lot of other issues that really make it difficult for them to fully embrace the kinds of changes that they're going to need to go through to heal. And some people are far more um, damaged from past life experiences than others. Some people have only recently been sick. They're easier to help than people who've been sick for 20 years. So to answer that question requires what exactly has triggered this illness for them. And then um, how do they find the right docs to work with? Now that's hard because I don't think there's any kind of a clearinghouse in the alternative or integrative medical world for anybody's skills, experience, or knowledge. So we'll often have someone going to see someone who has a little bit of training 
and thinking that they can do a lot. Right. And then it doesn't do much. These are the people you're talking about who've seen lots and lots and lots of doctors. Yeah. And so, I mean, what is their clinical experience? Have they helped people that complicated before? Yeah. I, you, know, you know, it's funny. I, I think it was probably not the greatest question to start with, but I'll tell you why I thought about it. And I, I, just to bring this up to patients, I, I, one of the things, you know, again, reading your book, which I enjoyed so much, was it, it came out, you know, how much extra training you did. You didn't learn this in your residency, you know, or like a fellowship. And I, I like to think of myself too. It's been a 30 year learning thing. I've done training upon training, never stopping learning. And I think you know, I know that's hard for patients to know because again, they go to a, a person with a degree, an MD, an ND, you know, something, chiropractor, and they assume that, you know, they're um, not only well-trained, but have a lot of experience. And, you know, what I got out of your book, which I enjoyed, and we're going to go into a specific question in a moment, but it's that like, you really never stopped learning. You know, I mean, you, you obviously, from whatever you started out 30, 40 years ago, you know, these diagnoses didn't even exist. So, uh, yeah, I think it was like a little bit of a curveball question. I just, again, I got the, the sense that, you know, where do, you know, patients are looking, where do they find doctors who are experienced or skilled at, at this? And I, I almost, like, you know, like you say, it's like you almost have to go along the, with the ride with them saying, I'm, we're going to learn this you know, to help them figure it out together. All right, let's get into specifics because, again, I thought your book, Toxic, honestly explained this next topic better than any other literature that I've come across. Now, I've also done training with uh, Richie Schumacher and um, I read articles by uh, Dr. Brewer, who I know you mentioned in your book, but in your book, Toxic, you really do a great job explaining to whether it's the, the reader or patient or doctor how to go about evaluating toxic mold uh, exposure. So if you wouldn't mind, I mean, going through a little bit, you know, how you, your steps you take in evaluating a patient that comes to you said, look, I've had, I believe I've had toxic mold exposure two years ago, three years ago, but I'm really sick now. And as you show in the book, the, I, I love that picture of all the different symptoms. It's very graphic for patients to, you know, to, to get an idea of, of how mold can cause so many different things. So how do you, how do you typically, if you can sort of run through that a little bit, how you uh, value, and I'm, I'll ask you some questions on certain tests that you order, because again, I want to know how relevant they are. So I first start. Sorry, with Dr. A, Nathan, I just wanted to ask that you look at the, the screen where the camera is. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I typically start with a very detailed history. My new patient visit are all two hours long. So it isn't going to be a 15 minute, um, um, let me get the basics and then that's all the time I have for you. We really need to get down and talk about their symptoms because that's where you get the information that you need to make the diagnosis that you're going to be working with. Okay. Um, so for a mold patient, which is not that different from a patient with Lyme or mast cell activation. Yeah, we're going to get into that, Why? how they're yeah. so confusing and overlapping, right? Right. Exactly. It's an overlapping symptom pattern. But if someone comes in and tells me that they have had some exposure to mold, um, it doesn't need to be recent. It could have been 20 years ago. Right. But they've had some exposure to mold. And at this point in their life, they're having symptoms of fatigue, cognitive difficulty, difficulty with focus, memory, concentration, word finding, brain fog. Um, respiratory difficulties, shortness of breath, air hunger, sometimes wheezing, um, neurological symptoms of a wide variety, especially if they're atypical or unusual. Well, you know also too, Dr. Schumach brings up, and you have it in your thing too, that, that whole idea of these electric shock sensations, because it sounds crazy when you know a patient says it and the doctor's like, what are you talking about? So, right? I mean, that's like one yeah. of the- uh, Electrical shocks is a, is a symptom that's what we call pathognomonic of mm -hmm. mold, meaning when you get that, you pretty much should be thinking mold. Right. Um, also, ice pick-like pains is typical for mold. Um, pains in the joints, muscles, muscle cramps, muscle spasms, um, intestinal difficulties of every type, uh, diarrhea, um, vomiting, nausea. Um, so you get someone who presents to you with this wide constellation of symptoms that 
Um, for other practitioners, I'm very well aware that these people come into their office and they go, oh, this has got to be in your head. No, nothing has all of those symptoms. Right. And unfortunately, those, uh, those practicing um, physicians have not heard of uh, mold or Lyme or co-infections or not, mass cell activation. They're not in their training. That, I mean, that's, that was my, to, when I go back to that point, I mean, myself included, I'm a board certified immunologist, allergist and infectious disease. I had none of this training until I did it on my own. I had reached out to Richie Schumacher, again, tried to educate myself. And now seeing these cases over the last two, three years, you, you quickly see that exists. I, one other thing too, it was on 60 Minutes yesterday. I mean, even this whole post COVID long hauler syndrome. I mean, I think it's gonna make doctors appreciate that you can have some kind of exposure infection and then months and years later have these wide ranging symptoms, which I think gives you know, more validity to, uh, you know, to even like these toxic mold patients. So let me ask you, okay, you're, you're absolutely right. The history is obviously really key in, in spending time with the patients. What about the visual contrast of testing? That's again, something I never had heard of before working with Dr. Schumacher. Do you find that a good screen? Do you typically do that on most of your patients you know, where they do this eye test, which they can do online? just so patients know to see if they have a biotoxin illness. Have you found, I mean, I'm really curious in your experience. Have you, I mean, I see a lot of patients that fail it. So is that, uh, is that helpful to you? Not as helpful as I thought when I first learned it. Right. I, mean, I started working with Dr. Shoemaker in about 2005. And we um, kind of together did a lot of teaching together. Mm. Uh, we, we don't agree on some of the important details of how to and evaluate that, I, and treat mold toxicity. Yeah, I know, but, but I like your approach. Yeah, go ahead. But so I started doing visual contrast testing in all my patients back in 2005, um, understanding even then that it was a test that, that for kind of a global toxicity and inflammation in the retina so that it not only is positive for mold toxicity it's also positive for lyme it's also positive for mercury toxicity right. and probably a few other things as well so for me in the beginning before we had the urine mycotoxin testing right. we'll it was the right. standard it was standard right. that's what helped me put it on the map Right. But as our testing improved and as we became able to uh, identify with a lot more precision what we're looking at, um, I still do it, but it's simply a inexpensive general measure mm. that someone has some toxicity that we need mm. to be looking it's, at. It's here. like a sedimentation rate. It's like that old test we use in yeah. blood. Yeah. It just It sort of alerts us that something's off, but it doesn't really pinpoint anything. Okay. Right. Fair and, enough. And, and I just want to add for people who are using it, I don't think it's as precise for mold toxicity as sometimes claimed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and because Dr. Shoemaker doesn't do urine testing, I know. He, he uses that as the end point of our, oh, you're, you're well right. now because right. your visual contrast has come back in the normal range. Yeah. But what I see is that it'll come back in the normal range long before the toxins are completely gone. So uh -huh. I think people need to be careful with that particular test. Yeah, so let's move on to that. That also I did find confusing with him, you know, why he doesn't like the urine mycotoxin test. And I felt a little bit um, validated because I, 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 you know, I find it interesting. And again, more data to me is helpful. Um, you know, so just out of curiosity too, do your, your argument, why, why, you know, why is he thinking it's not important? And I think you make a good case of not only is it important, but it's important because it, you have to be very careful, it's tricky because the mycotoxin levels can actually go up while you're treating somebody as they're releasing more from their tissue. So um, can you talk a little bit about that and about the two different labs, real time and Great Plains, you know, again, how you mentioned in the book, you know, they give you a little bit different information and, you know, cause again, this is costly for patients. So they have to decide with their doctor, you know, which way to go. Well, having mold toxicity is costly. Absolutely. Uh, so Absolutely. Um, it's not that expensive a test from okay. either real time um, so the first test from real time is $399 and the first test from Great Plains is um, uh, 275. Mm -hmm. um, now that's not inexpensive, but to make a diagnosis when you've been sick for years, yeah. that's not that expensive. No, either. no, I agree with you. Would you do yeah. both though? Let's say a patient said to you, no, this is a little bit pricey. Would you have, I mean, not to, that we have to get to, you know, compete one versus the other, but one would you do initially? Or you think they need both? 
I personally do both. Yeah. And the reason for that is the, the methodology of both tests is so different. Mm. They measure different things okay. differently. So even though there may be the same name right. of a mycotoxin that they're measuring, for right. example, ochratoxin, they do a different job with the other, with the different mycotoxins. So for example, um, Great Plains does a better job, in my opinion, than real time on ochratoxin and mycophenolic acid. But in my opinion, real time does a more accurate job with aflatoxins, trichothecenes, and gliotoxin. Oh, that's, that's important. Those are great. So, mm -hmm. so if you only get one, you'll often miss the mm. presence of some important toxins. Okay. And the reason that's important is if you're not specifically treating each toxin with the correct binder, you're going to incompletely oh. treat your patient and they simply will not be getting oh, better that, that, the way you want. That's a great point. I want to get into that in a little bit. And when we, you know, when we get through with the diagnostics, great points, really, <clears> really key points. All right, let me move on to lab markers if I can. I want to ask you too, because again, this is something that Schumacher pioneered. I find it sometimes hard to get labs to do it and whether they're done right. I mean, again, the MSH, the melanite stimulating hormone, C4A, MMP, TGF beta, these are all like the hallmarks of his program. Do you use them, you know, initially to diagnose patients? Do you use it to follow patients? Um, what's your, your clinical experience with that? Well, I did in the beginning mm -hmm. when I was working uh, with Dr. Shoemaker, but mm -hmm. um, I found fairly early on that I was not convinced that those markers um, adequately reflected what was going on with the patient. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple of experiences where I would get those markers in short periods of time and the there were profound shifts in those mm -hmm. numbers go mm -hmm. up and down like a yo-yo right, right. um when i when i was able to get urine testing i found that those markers did not correlate with the patient's illness anywhere near as well as the urine testing did mm. oh, that's um, a good point. so i know a number of physicians trained by dr shoemaker have taken oh your c4a and TG, mm. tgf beta are now mm. normal the mold is gone if you're doing urine testing you'll see that's not the case usually mm -hmm. so the other piece of that is that those markers are generic markers of inflammation, right, not right, mold. Right. So that in my case, I see a lot of patients who have multiple uh, confounding diagnoses, meaning they right. not only have mold, they also have Lyme, they have chlamydia, mm -hmm. they have mycoplasma, they have viral infections, right. they have heavy metal toxicity, right. all of these things contributing to an inflammatory load. Mm -hmm. And these markers don't distinguish one from another. Yeah, those are great. So points. again, I don't get them anymore yeah. because they don't really help me yeah. to, to hone in on what is my patient's diagnosis right. and and how do I do I need to proceed to treat it? What about also the mark counts, the nasal swab? Do you typically get that, or is it if they have sinusitis, or you just like to see if they have those? Um, biofilms down. Uh, well, again, Marcon's is what we call a commensural infection. Right. It's not an actual infection. Right, right. Um, it lives in the sinuses of most people. Mm -hmm. So merely having it doesn't mean it is affecting you. Again, when I started with Dr. Shoemaker, he persuaded me that it was a critical thing to be measured and it mm -hmm. had to be treated aggressively. But over time, even when I was treating it aggressively, First of all, eradicating it is extremely difficult. Right. Rarely happens. Mm -hmm. And when you did, I didn't see people responding clinically. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the treatments that we gave helped them with a runny nose or some congestion. Yeah. Right. But I'm not convinced that that was treating the Marcons. That may or well have been treating other infected mm -hmm. components of the sinus areas. So I don't get Marcons. I don't follow it, okay. and I don't think it's important in the healing process. And you right, know, this I mean, is great, great information. I, as I said, I really love the way you approach it. And you know, again, you know, sometimes I have patients that say, "Well, I want to see markers, I want to see things." But again, as a doctor, if I explain to them, it won't tell me that much. I think they they tend to respect that. What about the home evaluation? You know, looking at the ERMI or the Hertz Me Two scores again, an issue again, especially 
if somebody has to get out of their home or whether, you know, really to verify is that, again, you have to work with, you know, reputable companies to, uh, to do that. Yeah, that's really important. That's one thing that Dr. Shoemaker and I completely agree on, mm -hmm. which is you can't get well if you remain in a moldy environment, mm -hmm. be it home, work, car. Um, if you have continued ongoing exposure to mold, you cannot get well. Mm -hmm. um, that's just basic. So for someone who has mold toxicity, it is imperative that they have their home evaluated. Now, there's several different ways of doing that. The uh, um, ERMI testing, and uh, Dr. Shoemaker has put together a shortcut way of looking at those numbers called the Hertz Me Too, which allows us to kind of quickly get a feel for how toxic is this home. Mm -hmm. And so do I use that? Absolutely. I'm also fond of using what are called mold plates. You are? You like those? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, they're inexpensive. Right. And they allow us to do something that er, that Ermi doesn't, which is to check every room in the house separately. Hmm. So you can take a, a, a mold plate, which is simply a Petri dish that has a medium in it that grows mold. And you can take a plate, open it on the floor of the of the room that you're looking at. You open it, take the top of the plate off, let it sit exposed to room air for two hours, mm -hmm. put the top of the plate on and see what grows. If Wait, nothing, well, ask you a question. So what do they do with that? They can, buy, can I don't know, the Home Depot, those places have these mold plates? Or they what, they, what they do, but- Where do you get it from? It's, and not, a, it's not enough to get a plate. You need to have access to a yes. company sure, that can right. evaluate those plates. Right, right. Okay. And the company that I've used for years is called Immunolytics. Immuno Lytics, like Lytic, like L-Y-T-I-C? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. Excellent. Okay. So you can get the plates from them. Okay. Put them in your home. Watch what grows over a four or five day period. Mm -hmm. And then if a plate looks ugly, send it to them for analysis. Right. About half of the species that grow on those plates are not toxic mold species and mm -hmm. do not matter. Mm -hmm. So if that's what's growing, not a problem. They'll tell you that the company will say, or, Correct. or you'll see the, what it was. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you're growing toxic mold species in any appreciable amount, that not only tells you it's there, but it also quantitates it and it tells you what room it's in or rooms. That's a really good point. Right. If, wow. you, if you have it in all the rooms of your house, one particular species, say penicillium or aspergillus, then it, it raises the question of, is it in the HVAC system mm -hmm. of your home, spewing mold spores literally all over your house? Right. So they, they, then you need somebody more professional to assess Correct. that essentially. Correct. Okay. That's a great point. That's a great point. You know, people figuring that out. Excellent. Um, one other last thing too, just on diagnostics. Do you find the, the genetic markers helpful, like the HLA, the different B, you know, what I think what Schumacher refers to as the Rosetta Stone. I, I never really understood that and I've had trouble getting it. And I know they say, because they say about 25% of the people are more prone to mold than the others. Does that help you in any which way? Or once they're sick, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, so. Again, it doesn't. Yeah. Um, I, I, again, in the beginning, I used to get it right. um, routinely, but I did not find any correlation between the results of that test and how my patient did clinically. Mm -hmm. So I had many patients who had the supposedly dreaded um, uh, genetic markers, did great with treatment and healed quickly. And patients who had no genetic markers whatsoever often languished and did poorly. There was just no correlation at all. And I think over time, most mold specialists have come to the same conclusion from their own experience that um, I don't know the value of doing a test that doesn't really tell me something that's going to help my patient clinically. Right. And again, um, all of these things are expensive. You want to basically, if you don't mind the phrase, get your bang for your buck. You want to get information <laughs> that is useful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said, that's why I love having you on because, you know, again, being clinicians, as I like to say, in, in the, you know, in the trenches, we have to deal with so many things. You know, it's not pure academics. It's, it's true financial issues. It's true health issues. Get these people back, get their life back and get, you know, as soon as possible, you know, um, and that's what they want. Uh, let's move on to treatment because again, this also 
um, gosh, you know, I, I spoke to even different people who trained with Schumacher and everybody was always very tentative about the binders. You know, a lot of these binders, as you mentioned earlier, which are supposed to remove the toxins. I'd like you to explain this to the listeners, but a lot of them are very tricky. They have a lot of side effects. It's hard. To, and I love the way you put it in your book, you know, you know, the probably the least toxic to the ones that might be well tolerated. So would you just explain again for the listeners what binders, what's their purpose in, in this mold treatment plan and which ones like you would, you know, relatively like, you know, sort of go in order of, you know, safety and tolering, uh, tolerability, if that's a word. Sure. So first, let me back up and talk about something that keeps toxic patients toxic called the enterohepatic circulation. Right. Very in funny. which when, when you have mold or any other toxin in the body, the body takes it to the liver for processing. Right. The liver processes it. It puts it in a form that is capable of being excreted. And in the case of mold toxins, it puts them with the bile so that bile binds to those toxins to come down the GI tract and eventually hopefully get out to the outside world. Right. Problem is we have this way of conserving bile called the enterohepatic circulation. So when the bile, which is bound to the toxin, gets to the middle of the small intestine, the body recirculates the bile back to the, to the gallbladder, but it's still attached to the toxin, meaning it doesn't get out the body. The bile is still bound tighter to uh -huh. the toxin and right. back it goes to the gallbladder. So the concept of binders is that when the bile that is attached to toxin gets into the intestine, if there is something that binds the toxin better than bile, it will take, it will literally attach to the, to the toxin and now it'll pull it out the GI tract. Okay. Now it can go all the way out. So that's the purpose of binders. Okay. And again, Dr. Shoemaker and I don't agree about the specificity of binders. But Dr. Uh, Joe Brewer, who is an infectious disease right. specialist from Kansas City, who you referred to, has done a, a lot of research work showing that specific mycotoxins are indeed bound by specific, we'll call them binders, mm -hmm. so that knowing as you can on a urine test what the toxins are, you can pick the binders that are specific for it so you can have a comprehensive way of pulling this toxin out of the body. So to be specific. Yeah, can you give us some examples? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. If you have okra toxin, which is the commonest toxin right. that we mm -hmm. see, mm -hmm. the best binders are, as Dr. Shoemaker originally pointed out, cholestyramine or an alternative medication, Wellcol. Wellcol, yeah. Activated charcoal is a weak binder. But if you have aflatoxins, gliotoxin, or trichothecene, cholestyramine or Wellcol doesn't really bind that much at all. Mm. So things like chlorella, um, activated charcoal, bentonite clay, the good probiotic yeast, Saccharomyces boulardii, mm. mm. work for those. So again, knowing what toxin is in, we now know with much more precision what I need to give my patient to get it out of there. Okay, let me, let me ask you this. That's a great point because that really, you know, really helps delineate a little bit too. Now, like, just so we know, I mean, a lot, again, a lot of docs I've talked to cold star, I mean, so many patients don't tolerate it. I mean, Correct. it was a severe constipation, you know, it, you know, I know some of them have gone to the well call, but the well call I think has, aspartame in it or something, you know? No, no, no. Uh, no. Okay. So, well call doesn't have any additives. Okay. So okay. what would you, let's say, so you have a patient that has okra toxin, significant, and you were going to start a binder on them. Can you just go through a little bit? Like, is, would you, uh, I think you mentioned too, that you start, I, I like to, I would say, I love your approach. Like, no, you appreciate how sensitive a lot of these patients could be. Cause I've, like you know, a lot of doctors like to say, oh, let's just hammer away and give them a potent dose and get it over with. And like you said, nobody powers through this. You, you, you can power your way to the bed. <laughs> so what, what would typically you do? You would, you would start the one well called by like a liquid preparation or something, something a very low dose. No, um, I typically, 
start on even lighter, which even though activated charcoal isn't the best binder, okay. it's a good startup to get people okay. going. Mm -hmm. So I would typically start for okra toxin okay. with activated charcoal in very small amounts and slowly work up. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nature of my practice, and I need to uh, really communicate to your listeners that I basically see the most complicated patients who are the most sensitive and the most toxic so that um, my patients are very sensitive. A standard shoemaker dose of cholestyramine is four grams four times a day. Yeah. I don't have any patients who could do that. Mm -hmm. So I typically would start much, much lower doses. Yeah. I might start on an eighth of a teaspoon of activated charcoal. Mm -hmm. If my patients can work up to a whole capsule, and capsules can either be 250 or 500 milligrams, that's great. Mm. Once I know they can handle some dose of charcoal, yeah. I, I often find the charcoal is not sufficient to pull okra toxin out of someone's body. Okay. If they're very sensitive, I will start with a portion of a well call, meaning mm -hmm. a quarter or an eighth of a tablet and then slowly work my way up to somewhat higher doses. Mm -hmm. Some of my patients can handle cholestyramine, but I would start them on a 16th of a teaspoon mm. and then slowly work my way up. Rarely do my patients ever get past one or two teaspoons, mm. which is the equivalent of one four gram dose. A cholestyramine, um, it's a medication as opposed to being mm. something simple like right. chlorella, clay, or charcoal. Yeah. And as such, it does have side effects. Many of my patients get extremely constipated mm -hmm. from it, heartburn, um, indigestion. And if that happens, um, that's counterproductive. You don't right. want your patient constipated because then they're not pulling those toxins that out is, of the body. Right. I mean, I, the way I see it too is like why I like your approach is you're in this for the long haul. This is not, you know, to get them better. I mean, it would be nice to get people better in a week, but they've been toxic for quite a while that again, anything like, you, have to, you know, it's like when I do also desensitizations for food and environmental allergies, that's like kind of my specialty. And the end game is to get these people better. I don't need to get them better in a week or two because it's just not going to happen. The body can't handle that kind of intense desensitization. So right. again, just analogous to this, I, I like your approach. Like get, you know, it's, it's like, also I, I use the analogy all the time with patients like working out with weights. You don't want to go to a 200 pound weight, you know, your first week, start with those five, 10 pounders. You'll get, you know, you'll get to a good level. No, excellent points, all of them. Let me add to what you're saying that mm -hmm. there are patients who have mold allergy in addition to mold yeah. toxicity mm -hmm. for which working with mold allergy is really important to move them forward. Really? If you're allergic to something that is literally growing in yeah. you, yeah. in your sinus and gut area, you literally have something you're being exposed to constantly that's triggering an allergic reaction. Right. You're not going to get well until you get that out of your body. Yeah. Yeah. Well, these were super great points. And I thought you explained them so well in the book, even better, you know, on the podcast that I hope listeners, because we've had a lot of response to some prior, um, you know, topics on this. Uh, but again, your book, I thought was so well written. So again, again, anyone who has questions on this, I, I defer them to your book, Toxic. Let's move on to the next condition, which uh, again, I did do a podcast on this before too, but again, I just love your approach. And, and it's something, it's so fascinating for me, because again, as I mentioned, my background has been in allergy and we would occasionally see, I, I saw only a couple of cases in my whole career of systemic mastocytosis. But now we have this new thing called mast cell activation syndrome. And again, you know, what happens even in the allergy community for a while, they're like, no, no, this doesn't exist. This is just these alternative doctors coming up with a thing. And, you know, Dr. Lawrence Afrin, who I had on my podcast, um, did a lot of pioneering work on this. And I think it's fascinating because for me, I'll, I'll just share this with my listeners that, you know, so many conditions in allergy that I even saw in my own practice where like you couldn't explain them by basic skin testing or blood testing, you know, because we, we always thought of it, uh, allergy as an IgE mechanism, meaning, you know, the, uh, the, the cells produce um, IgE and that's what binds and causes the allergic reaction. 
But now we're realizing that these mast cells that are all over the body, they're on our skin, they're in our GI tract, they're in bladder and, and they're in the uterus. I mean, crazy places. I, did, I didn't even really realize that these are, are what we call our first responders in the immune system. And there are patients that have an ability, they're more sensitive that these mast cells release. And I just want to share one last thing before I want to get your opinion, you know, that I thought about this, you know, one of the first things they taught me in my fellowship before, you know, back th over 30 years ago, we used to do a lot of skin testing. Now I do a lot of blood testing, but we used to do skin testing. And the first thing we used to do is have the patient turn around and stroke their back with a blunt, you know, tongue blade to see if they had what's called dermatographia. And the reason we did that was because sometimes if they had that, their skin test would not be accurate because they're very reactive skin. But we used to tell the patient not to get nervous. You know, it's just, you know, it's just a benign, you know, part of the population has it. But now I'm thinking that honestly for mast cell activation, I saw a paper on this. I think 90% of the patients that have mast cell activation have dermatographia. And if they have reactive mast cells in their skin, why not in the other layers of their body? So again, you know, there are more other tests for it, but I, I think it's a great screening test. So let me ask you about with mast cell activation syndrome. I, again, you know, because we just went through with mold, so many of the symptoms are similar. How do you start to try to differentiate? And I know you mentioned in the book too, that you think mold can activate mast cell activation. So maybe just, you know, for our listeners again, uh, what starts to, what tests you do, what, what starts to alert you that hey, this is mast cell activation. And there's some, you know, obviously, you know, it's not a question of getting out of your apartment. It's a question of calming down your immune system. Really? And so I learned a lot about mast cell activation from Larry Afrin. Yeah, um, when his book came out, it was a um, revelation um, in terms of its depth. Not as clearly written as yours, though, I have to tell you. <laughs> it's like, I was like reading that book was well, like a, a meander. I, 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 uh, I, Right. It was a little I, I, I got through I, it, but it was a little tough to read. <laughs> I, I really love Larry. But <laughs> if you have Occam's Occam in the title. Yeah, that, gotta, that I don't you know. I mean, he really gotta, would. That's the, <laughs> All right. Just, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> just saying. Yeah. But about the time that I was starting to learn about mast cell activation, um, I was realizing that many of my most sensitive patients weren't able to take the binders at any dose. Mm. Even the tiniest dose of binder would throw mm -hmm. them off. Mm -hmm. We would often find that even taking a little homeopathic, you know, an extremely dilute material would really throw off a lot of my patients. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I want to expand this discussion, Dean, to I found that there were three major components that most of those patients had. They included mast cell activation, mm. but they also included dysfunction of the limbic system and dysfunction of the vagus nerve, mm. which uh, yeah. Stephen Porges, who writes about this beautifully, called polyvagal theory. Mm -hmm. and so those three areas were affected by not only mold, but also mm. by Lyme and by co-infection, mm -hmm. sometimes by viral infections, sometimes by other infectious mm -hmm. processes, so that it would trigger these conditions. Yeah. And they all interrelate. Yeah. It's very hard to talk about mast cell activation and not talk about limbic dysfunction, yeah. because each affects each system uh, very much so. So coming back to your question, how do you distinguish mast cell activation from what causes it, which could be mold or Lyme or, or right. what have you? Right. Let, me, let me add, the vast majority of people that I see with mast cell activation have mold and or have Lyme. Vast majority. That's an important and, point. Okay. And one of the things that Dr. Afrin doesn't talk about, uh, nor does Dr. Theoretes, who's also a considered an expert on this yes. subject, mm -hmm. is that if you look at mast cell activation as an illness isolated, you can treat it forever and make people better and more comfortable, mm -hmm. but you're not going to cure it until you figure out what's causing exactly. it. Exactly. Well, that's, that, that's a great point because, you know, what Dr. Afrin did bring out, you know, because with all those different things, and, and it makes sense because, and we're going to get to one of the really interesting things I'm going to bring up about treating this, is that the mast cells, again, are your, part of your barrier to the outside world. So, of course, they're going to react to changes in temperature, 
changes certain things in diet. I mean, you know, it, it only makes sense. Uh, so yeah, okay. So so I have to consider a mast cell activation in virtually everyone I see. Interesting. Now mm. it's tricky. The testing for mast cell activation is really difficult. It really is. The, it's just the, the, the mediators, mast cells yeah. are capable of making over a hundred or two hundred um, chemical mediators. Yeah. But they're present in the body for fleeting instance, right. very briefly. Yeah. They trigger a whole lot of other biochemical effects that last a lot longer than that. Yeah. But their presence is short. So you have to get lucky to catch it. You know, just to make test. that point too, you know, again, in my, in my training analogy and in, you know, what we used to learn too is like we had, when we used to deal with the ER, let's say if they evaluate a patient with anaphylaxis and they wanted to really you know, make the diagnosis versus something else, they literally had to get the triptase levels during that four or eight hour period when the patient was acutely sick. Otherwise they could miss it. And uh, so, yeah, just to, you know, again, I know with mast cell activation syndrome, you know, one of the things that Dr. Afrin brings up is a 20% change in triptase, which is really very little you know, and very, you know, it's like shredding a very fine line. So yeah, the, like what you're saying is the serum triptase, plasma heparin or histamine, even urinary histamine or PGD2. <laughs> you know, I, I've never gotten them and I don't know if they're really that valuable. Have, have you found it to be helpful or? The opposite is true, which is I think that some physicians don't want to go on record to treat something unless they can document it. Got it. Yeah. And so they'll get these tests and they'll go, well, your tests are negative, so I'm not going to treat you. Right. And, and my attitude is the opposite, which is, I think you have it and I'm going to treat it. The treatment is reasonably benign right. and really works beautifully. When you have someone with mast cell activation, they're going to be better within two weeks once you get going on giving them materials that will benefit them. You know, the thing too is obviously too, you know, again, one of the, one of the papers I was looking at before was, was really good. I think it was by the theory, geez, whatever his name is, is that a lot of it's skin and bowel, which again, these things, it just does, you know, the, the urine may not show any of this stuff. So that, that's why I like the, you know, the, you know, checking for dermatographia and, uh, and obviously the history is super important. Yeah, the, the, the symptoms that I look at to, to kind of push me in that direction initially are, a reaction that someone has immediately after eating or drinking something. Yeah. So if they get itching, sweating, oh, palpitations, mm -hmm. yeah. abdominal pain, mm -hmm. runny nose. Yeah, that's a great point. Immediately yeah. after eating. Yeah. I don't mean three hours later. Yeah, that's a I great mean, point. I mean within 15 minutes of eating. That's not allergy. Mm. That's mast cell activation. Do you find the diet helps a little bit, the low histamine diet? Um, and about in about fifty percent of my patients it helps, yeah. and in about fifty percent it doesn't. Uh -huh. So I do recommend trying a low histamine diet. Yeah, if it makes obvious difference and benefit. Yeah, yeah. Stay with it. Right. But if after after two weeks it's a very restrictive diet. Right. After two weeks, if you're not getting any benefit from it, there's no right. reason to continue. Yeah. Good point. Um, all right. Let's talk the treatment too. Um, you know, so again, as you were mentioning, I mean, avoiding the triggers is the key thing, whether it's temperature change, high histamine foods, certain medications, that sometimes also in itself will almost help you make a diagnosis. Some, some medications can release histamine. Um, I think like the SSRIs, believe it or not. Um, do you find some of the natural things help like quercetin? Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you find that helpful and vitamin C, things like that, that also like decrease histamine. Yeah, I, I find that Patients respond either to natural materials or to pharmaceuticals, sometimes both, but often patients have a preference. So I'll typically start with something in each category and see what they're responding better to. So I'll typically start them on quercetin, like 500 milligrams, 30 minutes before a meal. And I'll also add an H1 and an H2 histamine receptor blocker like Claritin and Pepsid. And then I'll see what I'll see what their body likes best. If they like the pharmaceuticals, I may add Singulair. I love ketotifen, mm. chromolin sodium. Yeah, I was asking, Those, do you like do you, do you prescribe the gastrochrome, the oral chromolin sodium? Do you find that to be? Um... I usually use chromolin sodium personally. I find I can titrate it better because it's a liquid. What do you mean you use it? Are you talking about the nasal? Thing? No, 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 chromolin sodium comes in ampules, 100 milligram. Oh, oh yeah, but yeah, okay. And mm -hmm. you can use those because 
again, with my very sensitive patients, mm -hmm. I may start them on a quarter of an ampule so mm -hmm. that I can, mm -hmm. I can titrate their right. dosing much better. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, I don't use gastro gastrocom myself, but many people do with benefit. Yeah. You know, actually also I found to work in, and I saw an amazing paper once years ago from Japan. Um, I'll just tell the story quickly. There was a patient that had exercise induced anaphylaxis and I don't know why they thought to use this, but they actually gave the patient uh, sodium bicarbonate, very high doses like before they put him on the treadmill and, uh, and fed him wheat, which is what he was highly allergic to only if he exercised. Mm -hmm. And it totally blocked the reaction. And I never forgot that paper. And now more than ever, I'm telling patients to take a teaspoon of baking soda and a little hot water each day that have this because, and there was a paper that just came out recently too. It's so fascinating. You change the gastric pH just a little bit and the mast cells don't fire. They, they, it's, a, it's a biochemistry reaction. So again, that's why probably the pepsid works. And uh, it's very fascinating, really, you know, how sometimes simple things. And I always like your approach, try the gentler, natural things. Again, if they don't work, again, that's why we're conventional physicians. Let's we'll use the medications to, uh, to do the job. All right, let's go on to another topic, which again, I, again, something that I see a lot of, and you have a tremendous expertise in, is chronic fatigue syndrome. And uh, again, you know, it's almost like if you drew concentric circles, you know, like, oh, what, what do they call it in, in school when the uh, overlapping circles? Venn diagram. Venn diagram, see? Um, okay. And it's almost like a Venn diagram of diagnoses, chronic fatigue syndrome, which you've done some work with Robert Navo. Is that the correct way to say his name? Navio. Navio. And this is what I find fascinating also. I just want to ask your opinion about this, because you mentioned that you and Dr. Navio had found certain biochemical markers that you felt helped. Uh, differentiate chronic fatigue syndrome from some other illnesses. I know it's interesting, Stanford, because I was doing a, some work on this too. They they found Dr. Uh, Jorge, uh, hmm, blanking on his last name, with Dr. Mark Davis. Um, they had found that they're what they call a cytokine signature, that certain cytokines were specifically elevated, you know, versus let's say rheumatoid arthritis. So what have you found with that? Um, I, I say, you know, you have it in your book, uh, about the sphingophospholipids and phospholipids. Are these practical tests to order in these patients? Does it help guide you in any which way? Well, you, in order to get the right testing, you need to get the test that Dr. Navio does, which is a, a mass spec evaluation uh -huh, following, yeah. mm. following liquid chromatography. And so um, you can get literally a thousand biochemical markers on one specimen of blood by doing oh, wow. that test, but it's currently a research tool. Wow, it's okay. not currently it's not available bad. for oh, uh, consumer mm -hmm. use. It will be. Mm -hmm. Many companies are working on different aspects of using that same technology uh, for measurement. Uh, for example, the the um, the urine mycotoxin test that Great Plains does uses that same technology. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, it's a very accurate technology and unfortunately you can't just run a pattern but mm -hmm. dr navio has now run a number of his um, age sex control studies with normals versus people with various conditions mm -hmm. that includes chronic fatigue gulf war syndrome mm -hmm. depression yeah, yeah. ptsd traumatic brain injury um, uh, autism Mm. Um, and so he has been able to identify different patterns of biochemical abnormality in each of these conditions. Mm -hmm. So eventually, when we have these complicated diagnoses, we're going to eventually be able to look at that type of an analysis and go, ah, this is chronic fatigue syndrome. Yeah, because you is, know too, chronic fatigue essentially with the blood work, if a conventional doctor or rheumatologist is going to act or neurologist finally gives up and says, you know, we did all the markers and everything, everything is normal. You have probably chronic fatigue or in some cases fibromyalgia, uh, but it's not like there's any test, whether it's a CRP or a sedimentation rate or something that's helped you uh, diagnose no. these patients. Okay. Well, well, let me take that in a different direction. Sure. Chronic fatigue syndrome is the final pathway for a wide, wide array of biochemical imbalances in the body. Okay. You can see it with, and it's often a combination. So you can see it with adrenal, 
thyroid, right, sex right. hormone imbalances, right. magnesium deficiency, right. variety of dental abnormalities. Right. You can see it with intestinal dysbiosis and food mm. allergy. You can see it with mold toxicity, Lyme disease, mm. viral infections. They all look the same eventually because they're all doing something similar to the body biochemically. That's a, that's a great point. It really is. It's so, like, it's so, the end point. so if you look at or look for those imbalances, um, I, I wrote about that in one of my earlier books, um, like healing is possible. Mm -hmm. The whole essence of that was these are the things you can look at that well, are the commonest causes of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. Mm -hmm. And more recently, we've discovered that um, mold toxicity and Lyme disease look just that way. So if you don't test your patients for mold toxicity and Lyme disease, basically you're never gonna get them well if you don't find the cause. Mm -hmm. Lyme is so tough, just to mention, I know I think you mentioned in your book, you like Igenix. I found it to be confusing sometimes, you know, because so few patients ever have the amount of bands that they say are sufficient to make the diagnosis. And um, it, it's, I think that Igenix is still probably one of the best tests on yeah. the market. Okay. And unfortunately, we're, th their newer testing takes in more species of, right. mm -hmm. of uh, Borrelia than we had previously. So our new testing is better. It's still not where we need it to be. Mm -hmm. It's still not as pinpoint. And keep in mind that if you have Lyme disease, Lyme weakens the immune system's ability to make antibodies. So even if you test negative by an Igenix test, it may be that your immune system is so compromised from the Lyme that you can't make antibodies. If you have a strong index of suspicion that this is Lyme and you treat people with antibiotics, then you retest them six months later, you'll often find uh, significant IgM titers for Lyme. Mm, so again, it, it's inherently difficult to take antibody testing in a, in a patient that has a condition in which making antibodies is compromised. Yeah. Um, you gave me an idea I want to talk to you about, but just one more thing too. You know, sometimes when I'm treating my chronic fatigue patients, I use IV vitamins, you know, something similar to Jacob Teitelbaum, who's actually the one who uh, mentioned your name that made me come out and reach out to you. He's a really big fan of your work. Um, you know, so we do the IV vitamins similar to his protocols. We use glutathione, which I find helpful in patients. Uh, but you also mentioned Patricia Kane's work about, which I've heard from a few other practitioners about the IV phosphatidylcholine. Can you explain why you find that to be, um, in, you know, important in certain treatments? I'm not sure. Do you, do you recommend it in chronic fatigue in some cases or other oh, issues? I, I, I... Not specifically for chronic fatigue. I want to mm. emphasize, if you're treating chronic fatigue, figure out the causes so that you can be treating them specifically. Yeah, yeah. I think that the Patricia Kane protocol is more useful for people with different types of toxicity. So um, I love intravenous phosphatidylcholine, for example. You do? You think it's, it's really helpful? Yeah. Absolutely. It's very, very helpful for mold toxicity, but any other type of toxicity, be it environmental toxicity, uh -huh. um, heavy metal toxicity. It's, it's a great drug to essentially reboot and stabilize membrane physiology because every membrane in our body is largely composed of phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylinositol, phosphatidylethanolamine. That group of phospholipids is critical in membrane physiology. And it appears that when you give intravenous phosphatidylcholine, you're markedly shifting those membranes to become more fluid. They go from being rigid when some of the um, higher fatty acid materials get mm -hmm. tacked on mm -hmm. as the body's metabolism mm -hmm. gets messed up, mm -hmm. which it does in chronic fatigue. Yeah. In, our, in our paper with Bob Navio, we showed clearly that that, fuss, that sphingolipids was the single most important right, so, yeah. variable in mm -hmm. both men and women in defining chronic fatigue as a variable. So it isn't a shock that membrane physiology would be messed up in a chronic condition. That mm -hmm. doesn't strike me as a, a mm -hmm. stretch. Any, any significant side effects with the phosphatidylcholine or not really? It's pretty safe. Like binders, 
in very sensitive patients, you have to use a low dose. Yeah. You can't just jump in with high doses. Otherwise, it's very benign stuff. Very, very helpful. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I learned over the years too, you know, that's why you really, you know, even when you do IV therapy, you know, so many places have popped up, have these IV bars and all this stuff too. But, you know, you really got to know what you're doing. I mean, again, I learned from a guy named Dr. Mitchell Gannon in Florida about screening for G6PD deficiency. And and one of the other things I learned, I'm just curious your thought about this, like even glutathione, like also, I, again, using your advice, like, you know, well, we used to give a standard dose of glutathione about 10 cc's. Some patients got intense flushing, chest pain, I mean, it was, it was pretty scary. It looked mm -hmm. almost like an anaphylactic reaction, but I realized, I think it was more of like a histamine flush. Yes. Right? Yes, and, and, I, uh, and, I've, and I've seen that myself. Yeah, it's very scary. I, I've learned that, you know, I, I've treated it with antihistamines when it happens because the patients are so distressed. I mean, sometimes it'll go down on its own. And then what was interesting too, we had one patient who was having these large smoothies before he came to the office and it turned out he was having avocado, which is a high histamine food. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't know mm -hmm. if that was triggering it, but... Um, Again, but you find glutathione to be important. And I meant to ask you, did you measure that like in the blood, like the glutathione in the red blood cell or something when you're evaluating patients and stuff? Do you find it to be helpful? It's, it, it's hard to get a good assay. Yeah. The, the only lab that I know of that does an accurate measurement of glutathione, which includes measuring both reduced and mm -hmm. oxidized glutathione is health diagnostics in New mm -hmm. Jersey. They do a great job with it. Mm. Um, the other labs, and it is available from other labs, I find them quite inaccurate. Mm. So, Does it give you information though that's helpful? I mean, like if you see someone has a low, you know, reduced whatever serum glutathione, do you, I know you mentioned this about methylation. Do you, yeah. do you feel they're not so, a good methylator? I mean. So the answer is yes and no. Mm -hmm. Meaning because of the concept of the cell danger response, the mitochondria intentionally start changing methylation chemistry and using glutathione differently. So because methylation is compromised in virtually all of our patients, um, you're going to get low glutathione levels in everyone. Mm -hmm. So is that useful? Not really. Mm -hmm. um, you can almost assume that everyone you see is low in glutathione. Mm -hmm. However, taking it is a two-edged sword because for some people, they respond beautifully to it. They love it. They go, uh, wow, that's right. great. I right. feel I great on people, it. Right. And some really people, different. you can throw them under the bus with small amounts of glutathione. Yeah, interesting. Because especially in my mold patients, glutathione does mobilize toxins quickly. Yeah. But if it mobilizes toxins quickly and the patient's ability to get rid of those toxins is compromised, which it is for most mm. of my patients, mm -hmm. you'll make them worse. Mm -hmm. So I would say that at least half my patients can't take glutathione because it makes them worse. And I, and I want to toss out one more important concept for it because okay. everyone's in love with glutathione these days. Yeah. I just want a note of caution. Glutathione is the end product of methylation, mm -hmm. one of the major end products. The body has a biofeedback loop with glutathione. So if it senses that you have a ton of glutathione on board because mm. you're taking it exogenously, mm. it's going to stop methylating going, okay, mm. great. I don't need to methylate. Got all the glutathione you need. And the last thing you want is to have your body shut down or decrease methylation chemistry. So how, was there a way you would predict? I mean, do you look at the MTHFR status when you're no. deciding on? No, I don't. The okay. MTHFR status only tells you about genetic potential. Mm -hmm. It does not tell you how well they're methylating. Mm, interesting. You can almost assume that everyone methylates. So mm -hmm. I do like glutathione and I use it after a trial and error process with my patients where mm. we'll try it. If they respond well to it, mm -hmm. I'll keep using it. Okay. If I try it, and they'll go, ah, mm. it's off the table for a long time. Not permanently. Yeah, no, I, you know, I, I, it's so funny. I, again, it's so enjoyable talking to you because I had to just sort of discover this on my own. Like, you know, when you're in the wilderness, you know, and, uh, you know, Dr. Teitelbaum's in Hawaii enjoying himself. It's hard to, it, <laughs> you know, is. all of a sudden you have it a is. patient in the office. You're like, what the heck is going on here? But I learned after one or two, almost you know, by, and I knew how I thought beneficial I had seen from certain patients that I learned, you know what, we do what we call test doses. We start out with low doses, yes. they tolerate it. We try to increase it. And if it's beneficial, we continue it. If it's not, 
you know, we. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, yeah. Jacob is a very good friend of mine. Is, and um, I, I've, uh, about you. I've I've shared uh, my ties on his veranda in Kona, <laughs> which oh, you have you lucky person. <laughs> which he's he's got a beautiful view of Kona and the it stretches out below him. It's it's a nice way to hang out. Yeah, he figured he figured out the uh, you know paradise. Um, all right, we're moving on to our little our final section. There's just a small amount of things I just still want to ask you. You know. One of the interesting things, and I think we're going to see this with COVID, you know, unfortunately, and you you talk about this, and again, I thought it was so really excellent the way you explained about the cell danger response, because what I try to explain to patients, whether it's Lyme or certain other things, is that the initial infection or um, injury to the body can cause inflammation for months or sometimes years afterward. And so how do we decrease that inflammation? I actually learned a little bit from Jacob, and again, with my immunology background, I'll use intramuscular gamma globulin, not IV, because I found it's interesting. It, uh, it decreases inflammation without lowering the immunity, which is what I want. You know, a lot of the newer biologics do lower inflammation, but they lower immunity. So I, I found it to be sort of my special secret sauce and some really tough chronic fatigue, even chronic Lyme patients, because again, I think throwing more antibiotics at these patients are not what seems to help them. They start to get worse and worse in Canada, which is what I see a lot of, and I think sometimes is the end uh, stage in what comes to become chronic fatigue in so many patients. Uh, my question to you also is, you mentioned, which I liked about the IV, ar um, about Argentin 23, which either as a nasal, oral, IV. And again, I learned this from Dr. Mitchell Ginn, who's in Florida, who I, I like a lot of his work. What do you think about the, um, I know he uses uh, IV uh, Argentin 23, the hydrosol, uh, but he has to put a pick line in the patients. I'm not even sure why, but it seems pretty intense, but he says he has a very good response. What's your thoughts about uh, that kind of medication for, uh, for Lyme or you know, these chronic tick-borne illnesses? Well, we've used the IV Argentin 23 as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. um, it's irritating to veins mm. if you, unless you have a pick line. So if wow. you're going to do it, you have to have a pick line. Mm -hmm. You can't just use a peripheral line for it. Wow. It's, it's going to be too irritating. It isn't going to cause thrombophlebitis, but it will cause phlebitis mm. and in too high a percentage. But we used to do that with our Lyme patients. Um, when I worked in a previous clinic. That was something we did regularly. We added really? it to their treatment program. Okay. And I did find it to be quite helpful. Interesting. You know, I've used the Argantin 23 nasal spray with some of my patients with really bad um, sinus issues and like for mold, I found it also to be right. You know, I, I use it. I use it orally and nasally routinely in my, in my, so I, my, my initial thing is when I met Dr. Gen, I said to him, my patients aren't going to turn blue, right? Like the guy in the circus. Well, you know, but... No, no. <laughs> the, the, the key, the key to Argentin 23 is the 23. Yeah. The 23 is the particle size It's 23 parts per million. Oh, okay. And, and if you keep the particle size at that level, even intravenously, I've never seen um, Argeria. I've never yeah. seen someone turn yeah. blue. That's what he said. Also, I mean, thank God. You know, that would that would be the that would be the, the well, malpractice case of the century. Right. I'd have to leave the country. <laughs> As a warning to your patients, you will see it when the particle size is higher. And so oh, really, really. And so, and so what I I have seen a couple of patients with it. They really. They literally look like Smurfs. How did and that happen? They they took the they were the they they were given, you know. Some people decide, oh, I can make my own Argentin twenty three at home. Oh wow! And 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 they swear by it. You know, I've got my own homemade stuff. Ooh. And if the particle size is wrong, oh, wow. then you then you can get it. And and these are blue people for life. I know. Once, I'm saying once, wow. it, once it gets into the skin, the, the body can't eliminate it. So you got to really count. These companies have to be really good about making the uh, Argentin 23, right? right. You don't want to. They're very careful very... about it. And that's why. Mm. But, but in that form, as far as I can tell, it's completely safe. Okay. And even like the nasal, obviously, that's not intravenous. I mean, could... Same particle size. You're not going to get into trouble with that. Yeah. Interesting. And I, these are the things I think patients, you know, should be aware of because, again, a lot of them have 
had, uh, you know, been through everything. And, you know, again, as I said, a lot of these cases, more and more antibiotics. Okay. Well, oh, one last thing I want to ask you about with antifungals, because again, I use it a lot in treating candida. I have found tremendous success. I unfortunately had a not such a pleasant discussion with Dr. Schumacher uh, several months ago <laughs> before COVID, how, how he was sort of yelling at me, don't you give it to patients. But I'm like, I have helped so many patients with candida and chronic fatigue. You know, I've stopped people from getting their third sinus surgery, you know, when we realized it was due to fungal. So out of curiosity, how do you like to use them? Do you do like, you know, one pill every third day? Do you do it sometimes for what? Or do you do it for a few months? Once a week. What's your no, sort of you have you, you have to be aggressive about treating the fungal component of it, and okay. it isn't going to go away quickly. Candida cannot be treated in a, with a week of diflucan or anything else. Right. It requires a much more prolonged treatment. And I know that Dr. Shoemaker doesn't agree with me. Yeah, he has. I like to hear your opinion. That's why I don't have him well, on. Well, he's. <laughs> He's yelled at me for the same reason. <laughs> I don't feel so bad now. I was like, I was like a little turned off by that. I was like, you know, I, I don't mind a spirited discussion, but a, a, you know, like a sort of a, a demeaning lecture that I could do without at this point in my career, you know. Well, that he has strong feelings doesn't make them right feelings. Yeah. So right. again, I've worked very closely with Joe Brewer, who's yeah. an infectious disease right. specialist. Right. Mm -hmm. And Joe is very knowledgeable about the use of antifungals. Right. So much of what I do is based on Joe's approach. Okay. But, but I use um, nasal and oral antifungals for prolonged periods of time. You may have to treat people for a year or more to get the mold out of their body and to get the candida out. It just doesn't go readily. I don't pulse it. I use it consistently. You do it every single day, though, in a patient? Every day. Do do? Every day. Because they say that with, let's say, diflucan, whatever, it stays in your body. Ah, that, ah, no, that's separate. Okay. Every day for everything but diflucan. Uh, and I'll, I'll, ex I'll explain yeah. that in a minute. That's the one I use the most because it's supposed to be the safest. I'll sometimes use the other ones. But yeah, so let's say diflucan, would you use that sometimes well, well, twice well, a keep, week? Well, yeah. well, but keep in mind, diflucan and nystatin are great, but they mm. only work on candida. They don't work on any other kind of mold. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a yeah. lot of candida patients. So I was just curious. Right. No, no. And, and candida so, is extremely common in our mold patients, almost okay. universal. Okay. So nystatin, you can take consistently. But diflucan, yes, yeah. diflucan is very interesting in that it is so threatening to the candida that many people are not aware that candida can shift its form mm. in the same way that Lyme can yeah. into a cyst form. Right. So if it feels threatened by taking diflucan on a regular basis, mm -hmm. after several days, and that varies from one person mm. to another, yeah. all the candida will shift into a cyst form and become much more resistant to it. Mm. So I use diflucan one every two weeks. Interesting. So they're taking nystatin every day. Right. They do the diflucan once every two weeks. And you'll sometimes right. do that for a few months. You know, uh, um, a year, yeah. sometimes more. How about with the vaginitis? Like, you know, some of the women I'm seeing have terrible vaginitis. They're so uncomfortable. Is that, is that enough or... Well, I might be a little more aggressive with a yeah. vaginitis. Got I it. might use it for three or four days and then pulse it like one a week, mm -hmm. coupled with vaginal treatments like monostat, mm -hmm. so that mm. um, I'd get more aggressive about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we've done almost probably a little bit over an hour. This has been really unbelievable. I, I got to tell you, I've done a lot of podcasts, Dr. Nathan. This to me, you know, real world practicality. Um, I, I hope my listeners appreciate what you brought in helping, you know, these complex cases. Um, I want to thank you for making the time to come on the podcast and, uh, I hope maybe we get to do another one in a few months. Um, okay. because, uh, I think it's super informative. Okay. Well, thank uh, you, Dean. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for, for the time today. Okay.